Are unions and opponents of Senate Bill 5 now overreaching? From the Battelle studio at WOSU at COSI, this is Columbus on the Record. Joining Mike Thompson this week, Bill Cohen, State House Correspondent for Ohio Public Radio, Terry Casey, Republican Strategist, and Brian Rothenberg, Executive Director of Progress Ohio. If there is going to be a compromise to keep voters from deciding the fate of Senate Bill 5, it has to come by Monday. That's the deadline to pull a question from the November ballot. The chances for a compromise nil at this point. Unions and others who want to repeal the collective bargaining limits on public workers say, repeal the bill first, then we'll talk. Top Republicans say that's not going to happen. Meanwhile, the ballot board has approved language of arguments that will be posted at polling places in November. For the pro-issue two side, the side that wants to keep the bill, their argument begins, a yes vote on issue two will make long overdue reforms to unfair and costly government employment practices in Ohio while helping to get government spending under control. This is how the no on two argument begins. Issue two puts all of our families' safety at risk, making it harder for emergency responders, police, and firefighters to negotiate for critical safety equipment and training that protects us all. The underlining is theirs, not ours, Brian Rothenberg. By saying that we could die if Senate Bill 5 uh, wins, is that a bit over the top or no? It's not. I used to work for the mayor's office in Cleveland, and many times staffing levels affect how you respond uh, with emergency services. So we are going to have many different towns. We already had one in the central Ohio area where there was a big disruption, and now the sheriff in Mount Sterling is going to be taking over police uh, sources, and that's a direct effect on the budget. Um, you're going to start to see a lot of these type of things, and when safety services are overtaxed, that can lead to long, longer response times and problems. But, Brian, the thing in Mount Sterling had nothing to do with Senate Bill 5 or collective bargaining. I mean, the big thing is if local governments can't get some of their costs under control, and just today in Youngstown they nearly had a strike there. The OEA union stopped at the last minute, but one of the big issues was... At Youngstown State University. Right, Youngstown State. Part of the issue was the faculty right now, single faculty members, are only paying three-quarters of one percent of their total health care cost and the trustees including state senator harry michelle one of the key votes in passing the original bill in 83 says we've got to get it under control we can't afford to pay this much of the benefit cost you know here's the problem terry on the one hand you're saying that uh, you're not asking for these townships to have these types of problems but on the other hand you're advocating at the same time the actual youngstown strike by the way um, all of those professors had gone in and actually bargained, from what I understand, for no pay raises. They bargained away some of those issues, and the trustees came in and rejected an agreement that they had actually sacrificed quite a bit from. Um, what because you're they're, seeing... They're not on strike. It's, they're, they're, they're not on yeah, strike, yeah. and that's the other point. I mean, here's the problem that we have now. There's a deflation going on in public services. There's a deflation going on in salaries out in the economy and with consumers and it's a toxic mix that is going to lead toward safety problems in this state because Bill, there's just not enough money. Bill Cohen, the, the language of these two arguments, I mean, I don't think a lot of people read these things when they walk into the polling place. I think they have, they, they probably have a pretty good idea of how they're going to vote because of all the TV commercials we're going to see over the next few months. But they do give us a preview of the types of campaigns that these two sides are going to wage. The yes on two, it's in government efficiency, overdue reform. The no on two, anti-Senate Bill 5, is attack on the middle class. That's what this does. It's an attack on the middle class. And these two arguments illustrate that. Right. And, and the vote yes side, for example, played up. And I'm sure you're going to see it in the TV ads, too. They played up some popular parts of this new law, at least the polls show, people tend to like, although they don't like the overall bill, the overall law right now, they like the provision that says public employees should pay at least 15 percent of their health care premiums and 10 percent of their uh, pension costs, and that people tend to like the idea of merit instead of longevity for pay hike. So that's what we saw in the official vote yes argument. We're bound to see that in the vote yes, uh, in the vote yes TV ads. The vote no, you, you see a hint there that in their ads, and in their official argument, they brought up 
John Kasich. Well, why? John Kasich is unpopular right now with voters. Yeah, he's and, right here in uh, paragraph number three or four. In the, and in the and one of their arguments was as if in all the hospitals and maybe nursing homes, nobody would have any nurses. The reality, like in central Ohio, yes, at University Hospital, there is a public employee union contracts in place, but not at Riverside or not at Mount Carmel, but they're trying to make people create fear that there won't be any nurses when you need to go to the hospital. Here's the interesting thing about the language that I thought, which was they added a, le a piece at the end of it. I can't remember the exact language, but it basically says... It's a disclaimer. It's a disclaimer that we didn't check out any of these facts. And one of the reasons <laughs> is because most public employees are paying at least 15% of their pensions. Many of them are paying that 10%. Um, when it comes to the issue on merit pay, if it was testing that well, then why, when they suddenly came up with this sort of fabricated compromise, they wanted to get rid of merit pay? But here's pay. why they can't check the facts. According to a s spokesperson from the Secretary of State's office, they can't. State law prohibits them from changing the language unless it's over 300 words. So I asked him point blank. I said, if they were to say that Senate Bill 5 would cause you to lose your hair, he said, he didn't say it could be in there, but he said there's nothing they could do to prevent that kind of language or similar type of language from getting into the, onto the thing. That's right. Wouldn't These be wise to do that, but... You're, you're exactly right. These are just the arguments proposed from both sides, and it's not the job of the ballot board or the Secretary of State to endorse them, criticize them, or change them. And I'd give a little word of advice. There are some focus groups done down in Cincinnati, and one of the key findings was that if either side gets too over-the-top out of control and saying things that are outrageous, it turns people off. I mean, people are in a mode, they're paying attention to what's going on in the economics and the costs and taxes, and they want some facts and they want some information. And if either side or both sides just gets carried away with name calling, it's gonna backfire. But where we started is, when it comes to safety forces, people understand response times and the dangers behind response times and understaffing there. And when it comes to student classrooms, they understand large classrooms. They don't view it that way um, from, from what I've seen of surveys and, and focus groups. So it, it's gonna be an interesting fall, but on the one hand, I hear what you're saying, Terry, about what you're trying to articulate, but the bottom line is these issues uh, are affected because people understand at their core the needs for teachers to have smaller classrooms, the needs for response times. But Brian, the vote yes forces say in terms of police and fire, if cities can cut the pay of firefighters and police, there won't have to be as many layoffs. There will be less understaffing. Well, you know, here's the problem with that, Bill. I mean. First of all, um, these are folks that re that have to retire early. Second of all, uh, not all of these safety forces are making that kind of money. Um, you know, some of them, like dispatchers, do not make that kind of money. And the the third problem with it overall is you're talking about a consumer economy problem here, not a Wall Street economy problem here. And what these do is when you start cutting the public sector's salaries, you're also cutting consumer spending in that in that area of the state. And that's going to sort of spiral into higher unemployment, less consumer spending. And actually, Brian, in most cases, Senate Bill 5 has nothing to do with cutting wages. It's just slowing down the increase in the future because on an awful lot of teachers' safety forces, it's the increase of cost of living, plus step increases, plus the benefits, plus pensions. But it's the budget and Senate Bill 5 and this argument that you have to tighten your belt and make these cuts and you've got to do this over time. That's going to affect consumer spending, and, and we really, that's the core of our economic problem. Terry, they mentioned here that tax breaks for the rich is in the arguments. That's going to be a theme in this campaign. That's going to have some, uh, s some traction with middle class independent voters in Ohio. Well, it sounds good to do class warfare, and that's the president's whole campaign for next year, but the reality is this bill has really nothing to do with tax break, it's just playing, it's posturing, it's name calling. Uh, they really ought to stick and get back to the facts. And I can't understand why they don't sell it on the facts. I mean, another thing that bothers me is police, fire and safety, they specifically put in the law that allows for police safety to be negotiated a subject of negotiation. So it hasn't been left out, it's right there in the law. But the, uh, the realities are, the economic realities are, they're gonna hit that hard in negotiations, first of all. And second of all, this is an issue about some of these tax breaks to the wealthy. And the reason it's an issue for these tax breaks to the wealthy is increasingly, they're getting breaks while the middle class is getting squeezed with higher and higher taxes, with higher and higher uh, 
obligations at the local level, not at the state level. And this is going to put more of that pressure on there. If you want a good school, you're going to have to vote for a tax levy, or you're going to have to go through these cuts. So there will be this devastating squeeze on the middle class, and there's going to be a farther divide between wealthy and middle class. Moving past uh, November, whatever happens, a couple of national publications, the New York Times and Bloomberg, both published articles this week uh, indicating that John Kasich and Scott Walker in Wisconsin, the governor there, were making inroads to try to reach compromise with compromises with the unions. We saw it with the offer to the unions to negotiate this last week. Bill Cohen, have you seen a, a softer tone taken by Republicans, you know, since since the spring? I know they're, they're well, not in session right now. Just, but. J just in terms of them saying, um, hey, uh, may, why don't we reach a compromise before the election uh, and not go through this where both sides have to spend $20 million. But uh, that's the only softening I've seen. And, of course, it comes right after all the polls that show, yeah. at the moment, voters saying no to the entire Senate Bill 5. And, and part of it, Brent Larkin, a very respected columnist from Cleveland, guy that's really on top of things, he noted this whole thing is not going to be decided just on November 8th. Because even if this thing is voted down, the legislature is still in a position to look at different aspects of this and can still pass other laws in the future. But, but, if, it, but if it gets beaten badly, Republicans might think twice before coming back, even with some popular parts of it. And how arrogant that, they, that legislators think that if it goes to the ballot and people vote it down, that they're going to turn around and do it anyways. I mean, how arrogant but is that? But there are that? pieces of this leg of the bill that pe that it's 20 points in favor. The health insurance mandate 15 right. percent. That 20 well, the, 60 they, they 40 in favor of that. They could have done some of that early on. I mean, part of this compromise stuff is because of their low poll numbers, and quite frankly, part of it is a ruse. And I think. Uh, from the political theater aspect, it might have been okay until they turned around and did that uh, hearing where, you know, they had to sit there with the three people there, but nobody at the other chairs. I mean, that was clearly a stunt. It looked like a stunt. People in the public are smart enough to know that, and that really helped it hurt their cause. But, but Brian, right now on this table right here, I, it shows here's all the amendments that the House and Senate Democrats offered to make the bill better. There's no amendments. They didn't offer anything. They couldn't pass anything. Why would you? Why would you? They wouldn't meet with them. They wouldn't have a discussion with them about passing. They never passing put them. one why amendment in the Why would you put an hopper? amendment on that you know is going to be defeated when you know you have to go to the polls and you have to beat this thing back the whole way? All right. you, it was an arrogant way they approached this bill. We'll have to. We'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll mention it once or twice between now and, <laughs> and the beginning of November. There is another repeal effort underway. Opponents, mainly Democrats, of the election reform law are busy gathering signatures to put a, repeal, a repeal attempt on the November 2012 ballot. Part of the law prohibits county boards of elections from mailing absentee ballot applications to every registered voter, even, even if they did not ask for it. This week, Secretary of State John Husted issued an order prohibiting the mailing of unsolicited absentee applications, even though the law could be put on hold if opponents gather enough signatures. Bill Cohen, what was John Husted's reasoning for going around the law and around this repeal effort? Well, he says it's because he wants uniformity and that there should be uniformity. He points out that there's some uh, economically stressed counties that don't send out these applications to everybody unsolicited. Then there are others that are doing it, uh, especially the big counties, Cuyahoga, Franklin, Hamilton. And uh, so he says it's all uniformity. Of course, the Democrats will say, well, it's because uh, some of those counties, uh, especially Cuyahoga and Franklin, are voting Democrat these days. Uh, and uh, he wants to, he and other Republicans want to keep the vote totals down. And John Houston's uh, thing cited Jennifer Bruner in June of 09 when Mike Coleman wanted to pass a tax in Columbus. There was a tie vote on sending out these ballots as they'd done every year and every election since 07 in Franklin County. And Jennifer Bruner suddenly said, no, we can't do that because it would be unfair to not have uniformity. Well, if Jennifer Bruner in June of 09 says uniformity is important and legally responsible, uh, why are the Democrats now reversing field? Terry, my question is, why do people want to make it harder to vote? It is why are you trying to make it harder to vote? Sixty percent of the people in Cuyahoga County voted by absentee ballot. The long lines that we had in 2004, we will never forget, and one of the reasons that we got rid of them were early voting, getting rid of the long lines, being a little more friendly so you don't tell people that they can't tell you you're voting in the wrong place and you could go to another place. Why is there this emphasis on trying to keep people from voting? And there's a real simple answer. They're doing it in urban counties, and that affects certain people politically. And quite frankly, that's immoral. 
Well, Brian, it's not to keep people from voting. They have every right and every opportunity to vote. You don't want to waste taxpayer dollars, so we have the money for the sheriff's deputies and the other people like in Franklin County. But the counties say this actually can save them money because they need fewer resources on election day. If people have voted early, it spreads it out. It's more easily managed. It actually can be a cost saving. But the reality is, if you look at the numbers in 08, 09, 2010 in Franklin County, when you've got to operate early voting systems and you do vote by mail and then you still have the voting, it costs a lot more money to run all those multiple duplicative systems. When you start putting a price on people's ability to vote, you get into dangerous territory. You really do. And I'm not saying we're going back to what happened in the 60s and, and prior to the 60s with poll taxes, but that shouldn't be the consideration. It should be a consideration of making it easier for people to vote. So, Brian, you're one of the supporters of this repeal, the election reform law. What happens if the counties are not allowed to send out the applications en masse? My guess is that the campaigns are going to send out applications themselves, and then the voters will send it in. Campaigns will up in uh, Cuyahoga County, the, the new... Uh, ex executive there who's been pretty bipartisan. He's even hired some former Franklin County officials. Uh, Ed Fitzgerald has yep. just said, I'm going to pay for it anyways. It's the right thing to do. Um, look, it's, it's, it's a little harder, though, when it's not a nonpartisan board of elections sending it out than when a party sends it out just to their own folks. Um, you know, it's, it's just wrong the way this is unfolding. But Brian, all these things cost money and add to the confusion with voters because I remember an Obama person in 08 coming to my house and saying, you've got to go down and vote at the early voting center because the polling places will be so jammed on election day. And of course there was virtually nobody there. There was a lot of wasted tax dollars and poll workers there because we had all this duplication of all these multiple systems. So, And actually in Ohio in 08, with all this money spent by Jennifer Bruner and the counties, voter turnout was less in Ohio in 08 than it was in 04. But I have to tell you more, well it always, when you're comparing 08 to 04, it's post-presidential. It's in, it's in different areas that that happened, but, but it was par primarily because it wasn't as competitive an election. But I have to tell I you... I don't think John putting, Kerry believed putting, that. Putting no, Obama beat McCain by more than Kerry right. lost to Bush. Right, but it wasn't really an issue here in Ohio. But look, when you start putting a price tag on this stuff, you're getting into dangerous territory. Quite frankly, if 60% of the people voted in Cuyahoga County by, by, by absentee it ballot... Was actually maybe it was actually 47% the exact number but, of the four. But maybe your argument should be we should get rid of voting on Election Day like Oregon does. I don't know what the answer is here, but I can tell you it's not making decisions based on money. And this isn't about money anyways, Terry. We all know what this is about. It's about depressing the urban vote. Let's get to our next topic. As we mentioned last week, unemployment is inching up in Ohio. It's up to an even 9% now. This week, the state legislature and the Kasich administration basically said no thanks to $176 million in federal aid for jobless benefits. And this week, Democratic lawmakers proposed a bill that would make it a crime to discriminate against the unemployed, just like it's illegal to discriminate against applicants who are of color or women job applicants. Terry Casey, $176 million to help the unemployed. Why not take that? Well, if you own a home and somebody says, I'm going to do a free roof for you, and you'd say that sounds good, but if in addition to buying the roof, you've got to buy windows and new siding and everything else, because the concern was you might get that free money, but then once you establish this new level of benefits, these new programs, and you've got to pay for them from Ohio money directly or employer money, it costs more money in the future. You could end up, I mean, Ohio already owes today 2.6 billion dollars to the feds in money they've been advanced. But the feds disagree on that. They say you could have you could end the program after a year, after two years, after the recession is over. But but people like Brian would say, oh, once it started, we can't cut it off, we can't change it. All these things cost money. And right now the taxpayers are saying both with their wallet and how they live their lives and they want government to be a little more frugal and look at free money that costs you more down the line, that's not necessarily a good deal. You're going to I mean, use this as a campaign issue, I take it, Brian? I mean, I, you know, I've never seen a politician successfully use the equivalent of let them eat cake and win. Uh, I don't understand the logic behind this. And I have to tell you, Terry, you know, when, when you start talking about folks that are unemployed, if you're not getting any money 
and, and you're in a home, and you, you were paying that home, and you had a job when you got that home, you're going to lose your home. It's going to affect all the property values in the neighborhood. You're not going to be spending money at the grocery store. You're not going to be spending money on Main Street. It's going to have a, a multiplying effect on our economy. And it's that kind of thinking that has led us into this Wall Street-only recovery. Well, but the thinking that's got us in the problem is we need a president focused on generating economic growth like Ronald Reagan did in the early 1980s. i got to tell you, George W. Bush never did this with unemployment. In fact, some of this unemployment money started coming and these extensions started coming under George W. Bill Bush. Bill Cohen, quickly on the discrimination. Uh, this bill would make it a crime to when a, if an applicant came into an, uh, an office or a factory and says, I want a job, but I've been unemployed for a year, you can't discriminate against that person. Is it, is it, it's not going to go anywhere, but is that needed? Well, it's hard to tell. Uh, the Democrats say there are examples where companies have gotten on Craigslist or some of these internet websites and made it clear they would rather have people who have who currently have jobs. Uh, and and uh, the Chamber of Commerce, one of the uh, one of their specialists, was telling me, well, I've never really seen that really happening. But he says there's some logic to it because uh, maybe some companies feel that if you've been unemployed for a year or two, you've lost some job skills and maybe you've lost some, some work ethic. So they say that companies should be uh, able to discriminate in that way. There's nothing unfair about it. Then you've got Democrats saying, well, this almost amounts to racial discrimination because we've got minorities with higher unemployment rates. Uh, and so by discriminating against the unemployed, you're discriminating against Hispanics and blacks. To that, the, uh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, specialist was saying, well, if, that, if you can really prove that, that some particular class or race has been discriminated against because of this, well, then you can sue under the current grounds, yeah. racial discrimination. But more lawsuits, more government red tape. I mean, a lot of this was about Monster.com, an international or a national website, not a company in Ohio. We need to focus on economic growth. Like in Toledo, the governor was involved in announcing Chrysler a new plant, and hopefully Chrysler is going to spend more money to expand the Jeep facilities up there. We need to focus on getting economic growth because jobs are what we need, not more government red tape or laws that are designed for some website somewhere in the world. I'm really glad you mentioned that Jeep plant because, you know, it, it occurred to me that John Kasich opposed the, the major auto loan issue. And uh, here we've got a Jeep plant primarily because of Barack Obama's Jeep plant uh, recovery in the auto industry, something the governor opposed. But For a minute, I thought you were going to agree with Terry. Yeah, but, oh, well. but, <laughs> but you know, I mean, uh, now all of a sudden the governor's up there claiming the jobs. I'm all for the jobs. It's immoral to, like, discriminate against people. I'm surprised we have to legislate this, and I'm surprised the Chamber of Commerce would even advocate this way. We've got to get to our last topic. Most Central Ohio school kids are back in their classrooms. Their parents and their tax-paying neighbors are studying the latest school report cards. The marks are pretty good. 352 districts rated excellent or excellent with distinction. That's an 18% increase over last year. Those getting B's and C's, those rated effective or still under continuous improvement, were down 17%. And the number in academic watch dropped from 9 to 6. No district is an academic emergency, and the statewide graduation rate rose slightly to 84%. Terry Casey, does this mean the schools are getting better, they're getting better at taking the tests, or do they keep changing the standards on which they're judged? Well, it could be item D, all of above, plus <laughs> other things. And one of the little games that goes on is every year or two, whether they need it or not, they keep changing the rules of how you measure things. And one of the things we ought to do when you look at the Columbus schools, right now the dispatch covered of 2,296 teachers, they said only 72 were unsatisfactory in their performance. I think there's more than that. Obviously, there's a lot of great teachers, a lot of teachers who are working very hard, but if you look at the Cincinnati public schools that have already moved towards some merit and some other better ways of measuring performance, they're now the best urban school district in Ohio, and why isn't it Columbus? So part of it, instead of changing the rules every year or two, uh, we ought to have a little more uniformity. But you have to admit that probably the schools have they're being held accountable. The measurements are there. What gets measured gets done. Schools are improving. The, th the problem, the dilemma is, you know, when more than half of the school districts are getting an A or an A+, plus, it sounds a little too good to be true. It sounds a little like, uh, you know, Prairie Home Companion, where Garrison Keeler says here in Lake Wobegon, all the students are above average. 
Um, it just sounds a little little too good. Uh, maybe the standards need to be upped. I, you know, while things are improving, yeah. everybody's for things improving. That's great. Well, then why don't we let's let's make the standards a little higher. The graduation and, and rate gets higher. a little tougher next year. Right. If it, if it's working, why do we keep fixing it? I mean, it's working. So why are we constantly well, fixing it? And and I'm hearing that the Kasich administration is going to tinker once again with the funding formulas, folks. These kids aren't lab rats. It's do it. It's working. We got to get to our off the record final parting shots. We'll start with you, Brian. You're first. Uh, I predict that uh, we are going to have, under the ruse of tax reform, we are going to have a major package going through early next year, even if Senate Bill f Five goes down in flames um, from the Kasich administration, and it is going to be mostly about giving uh, tax breaks to friends and contributors. Sorry. In the next week or two, the state legislature is going to come back a little earlier than normal in order to pass a new law making clear, because of Jennifer Bruner's pending referendum filing, that Ohio's primary is going to be in May, not March, because if she files her thing, it could gum everything up in terms of filing deadlines and when we have an election for next year. And Bill Cohen. September 29th, the agency that hands out benefits to injured workers is going to okay the idea of offering discounts on the premiums that businesses pay to fund that system. The discounts are going to be from 25 to 51 percent. They're going to go to new companies moving into Ohio. It's just the latest example of the, uh, the Kasich, uh, what they call the pro-business incentive system. Okay. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. We urge you to continue the discussion online. We have a new website with archive video of each show. So if you miss us because you're watching hurricane coverage or you're watching high school football, you can go to our website and, and check us out. That's at wosu.org slash cotr. We also have links to our Twitter pages and Facebook page as well. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.